Hello, good evening. My name is Davion Fleming, Director of Admissions at Lake Limited High School. Really excited to have you all here today with us after a holiday. Um, again, I hope that your holiday was really great and, and fantastic and that you got to spend really um, good and quality time with loved ones. Tonight, we have our, our fifth and final open house focused on um, student support. And so you'll hear from um, a handful of different folks who support our students in a lot of unique and, and special ways. And they have a lot of wisdom to share with you all. I feel that when I am personally meeting with some of these folks, I learn so much more about um, the student experience and I become a better educator because of them. So I'm really excited to have you all here, um, have them all here with us to share with you. Um, but before we get started, we'll do a, a couple of introductions um, and we'll start with, with Elizabeth, if she's on, um, to say hello really quickly to, to everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Tackett, Associate Director of Admissions um, for Operations and Flexible Tuition. We're so glad you're able to join us virtually tonight. Um, I hope it's an informative experience for you. Um, and yeah, I'm actually an alum of the school working um, back full circle, working in the office. So I can just uh, attest to how wonderful of an environment it is. And I hope that this is a really informative time for you. Send it back to Davion. Thank you. Um, and next up, we have uh, Eric Temple, head of school, here to say hello. Hi, Eric. How was your how was your holiday? Hi, Davion. It was great. And you know what? Those jokes at the beginning really make me smile. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to take a quick moment to say good afternoon and to welcome you to our last open house of the year. Um, we're so pleased that you've taken some time out of your very busy lives to just keep learning more about the school. Tonight, um, you're just in for another great experience as you learn about the different ways we support our students, both academically, but also emotionally and psychologically and socially, and also um, the work of our um, of the Director of Student Inclusion, Naomi Fiero Pena, who really is working on um, student identity and how do we learn to love who we are and be comfortable in our skins and to interact with people who are very, very different from, from us. And it's just such an exciting environment here at Lake Wilmerding High School. So thank you for being here. You're in for a treat. You're just gonna hear from just amazing educators and adults who care so much about students. And you'll learn more about how we really nurture the whole student here at Lick Wilmerding. So thank you. And thank you, Davion. And I pass it back over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your time, Eric. Um, so we'll get we'll get started and kick things off. And um, to start, we're going to talk about our advisory program. And Miss Chris Yin and Miss um, Kendra Briggs are going to talk to you a little bit about our advisory program, what we focus on, and how we support students in that space. Chris and Kendra, take it away. Well, all right. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? We're good, Davion? Yes, we can see it. Wonderful, wonderful. So welcome everyone. My name is Christian and I'm the ninth and 10th grade Dean here. This is, I think I was counting last night. I think this is my 27th year at Lick. Um, and uh, it has been a wonderful, fun, exciting, challenging journey here. Um, and just so glad to be welcoming you here today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day um, to spend it with us. Uh, really appreciate that. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our advising program. And uh, first though, I wanted just to introduce the student support team. And so let me click over here. Um, and here is our agenda for today and who will be speaking, um, myself and then uh, Kendra Briggs. Kendra, do you wanna introduce yourself now? Sure, I can introduce myself now. Can you hear me okay? I can. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, welcome. 
My name is Kendra Briggs. I'm the 1112 Dean um, and I work with uh, Christian to oversee the advisory program and uh, I'll be sharing more about that in just a little bit. So I'll just step back. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dean Biggs. Uh, so as you can see here on our agenda, we have um, the advisory program. We'll be talking uh, about the Learning Strategy Center, then counseling and student inclusion, and then rolling into the student panel. And here is our Triple S team. Our student support services team is kind of a mouthful. So we see Triple S. And as you can see, it um, is compri comprised of um, deans, counselors, our learning strategy support team and our director of student inclusion. And so um, Kendra and I will be talking about advising. Um, and so just wanted to start off by sharing our mission with you. And that is the Lick Wormerding Student Support Services Team comprised of deans, equity and inclusion leaders and counselors serves the school community in two ways. So first way, a uh, most important is our immediate student support, right? And as you can see here on our slide, uh, we organize, manage, and communicate with students, teachers, advisors, and families, so lots of different people, about any students who are referred to us who may be experiencing a social, emotional, behavioral, or academic challenge, right? So we really encompass all aspects of a student's life. And we uh, work together to design and monitor interventions to address particular student and family needs. In particular, um, we've moved to this model of, um, we do talk about students as a whole team, but we work in mini teams that comprises usually of uh, the class dean and then a counselor, maybe learning strategies support, perhaps a director of student inclusion. But um, what's wonderful about these teams is that that means that that one student has, has his, her, their own team who is um, supporting that student. We also, also have the advisor as part of that. Um, and so uh, it's really wonderful to be able to work in those teams specifically for those students. So we have really great communication among those team members and we can share information that we might be hearing maybe from the counselors or from learning strategies of uh, people's expertise all together on that team. So I really appreciate how we work together for that. Kendra? Yeah, go ahead and go to the next slide. And um, I will say, continuing on with uh, what Chris just shared with you, besides working on discrete teams to support individual students, um, the other piece of uh, the Triple S team is really to think about school-wide access. Uh, so as it says, we're really thinking about identifying systems or practices that are barriers to uh, full student inclusion. Uh, so as we work as a team and collaborate on the different levels of experience at the school, we're looking to increase coherence among student programs. Uh, and that means that we envision helping create systems and resilience within those systems uh, that really support uh, both the well-being of the students as well as the academic growth. Um, and so some of those things are taking a, a look at kind of homework loads or thinking about access points in terms of transportation. Uh, it may take a look at how commute affects uh, students' abilities to practice or participate in after-school events. And so we've looked at the daily schedule. So there are a variety of ways that uh, we take these different pieces of knowledge that we have about our specific areas of expertise and the student experience and really try to look at the entire community and the entire community experience for students um, to enable them to participate more fully as themselves um, and in all different uh, kind of aspects of the program. Um, and within that, part of what we do, uh, Chris and I specifically as the class deans, is to look at the advisory program. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, as, as grade level deans, we work specifically with the dean of students to implement a school-wide advisory program. And that advisory program is something that every student participates in. Uh, it's a four-year program and they travel with their advisor. And so they really are able to form a deep relationship with that individual who then can form part of the support team and can be that touch point um, for the student, not only for academics, but for social emotional well-being, um, for other issues that end up kind of occurring as an adolescent grows through the high school experience. 
Um, so as we have our advisory program rooted in that relationship, we're really looking for uh, individuals uh, to have relationships that ensure being known, being cared for, and being supported. Um, and then the advisory program also provides opportunities uh, to practice skills that are needed beyond the high school moment um, and what it means to participate in and thrive in a diverse and inclusive community uh, that we have both at the school and that is going to exist in the world beyond. Specifically, when we think about the program, and as we've really thought about this program uh, within the space of pandemic learning and now, you know, being in, a, in an ongoing uh, struggle with COVID, we really want to make sure that we are emphasizing specifically four strands within the advisory program. Uh, and that is community and connection, care for both yourself as well as for others in the community. Uh, making sure that students have academic coaching and support in order to meet the goals that they're setting for themselves, um, as well as time for just celebration and play, time to be goofy together, time to recognize we are still in high school, we are still in adolescence, and um, there, is, there is a balance in how we communicate both the work as well as the play. And so the advisory program really wants to bring all of those to the forefront to enrich student experience and well-being. And I would say to add on to the play idea, yeah. our Dean of Students, Kate Wiley, worked really hard to find four strands or to take the ideas and find C's within those strands. So as you notice, the four strands have the letter C in there. And uh, we started off the year with um, Cookie Monster and a little video Cookie Monster for advising, which was very sweet and a lot of fun. And we are, we are trying to be playful at a time when I think um, things can feel very heavy. So thanks so much. Kendra, should I move to the next slide? Please do. All right. Um, and so as Kendra was already sharing, you, you can see um, what the design of, of the program is. And for this year, we really wanted to focus on cultivating, right? Um, and asking ourselves this question, how am I contributing to a community that is inclusive and supportive of all its members? And to really try to, um, uh, to focus on the connections that we're making with each other and how to cultivate those connections at a time when we are certainly seeing that our students just haven't had the same kind of practice or exposure to social situations um, that they have had in the past because of what's going on with COVID. Um, the other thing for this year is, you know, we really are trying something different with our advising program. We're meeting more often for shorter amounts of time because it's what our schedule dictates and what we need. Um, but we're really trying to be responsive to what the needs are of students. Uh, they have uh, shared with us that they want to be able to connect with new people um, to nurture those relationships a lot through play. Um, in years past, we have had a curriculum in advising that is um, a little more serious, a little heavier, um, delves a little bit deeper. And I think, you know, we decided as a team and also um, in conjunction with what students were asking for, that we were really going to focus on just being able to be together. And so um, the students have really appreciated that flexibility. I'll share today it was really fun. So we're we're going to be doing some uh, some advising competitions, um, fun games between different groups. And uh, today they got a chance to build their team. So they chose their team name, their colors, their mascot, um, uh, the song that's going to be their their uh, their like rally song. And it was really sweet to walk through the, the hallways and hearing the kinds of conversations and laughter that were happening as kids were choosing these things together. So we really want to leave space for that and also um, provide space for um, deeper conversations, getting to know each other, um, getting to understand each other's uh, backgrounds, experiences, um, identity in a deeper way as well, but also balancing that with the play. Okay, so Kendra, anything else you wanted to add before we move to question and answer? No, I think we have to watch everybody's time. So I wanna be conscious of that as well. So please. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing. Okay. All right. So if folks have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. But one question I have 
um, for you is thinking about how um, students transition to, to like, how does the advisory program help support them in their, in their transition to um, an, an independent school or just LIC in general? Absolutely. I mean, I think what I would say is um, students and their families are, are really looking for connection and to feel known. And so um, that's something that we really emphasize, particularly in the first quarter, um, which is um, focusing on the relationships between the students and each other, um, students with their advisor, and then also the advisor with the different families. Um, and so uh, th that's something that we recognize uh, is probably central to uh, students' experience and their success here, because if you don't feel connected to the people here, if you don't feel connected to the community, if you don't feel safe asking questions and um, reaching out to resources, then you cannot thrive. And so um, I would say that our we use our advising groups to actually do that because they are small groups um, this year of only 12 students um, and their families. Uh, students also, students and families also um, get together for advising gatherings um, uh, to uh, uh, just break bread together and uh, again, just making those connections um, and helping kids in the transition in that way. Yeah. And I would also speak to, while it's not directly within advisory, um, one of the things that uh, Chris does as the 910 Dean, along with uh, our Director of, of Student Inclusion, uh, Naomi Pena, is to create freshman orientations that happen both at the beginning of the semester as well as later into the year so that those connections continue to build. And so it's both within the advising groups where there is support, but then it's also about the entire graduating class as they're coming in and starting to build uh, their, their capacity to be in relationship one another. And so there are a number of ways that their communities are being built and fostered, um, especially within that freshman year that are exceptional. Great. And then um, a, another question from, from Amber, which is really great. So how do you partner with the Learning Strategy Center? And I know that Winifred is going to um, present next, but in what ways are you partnering with, um, with counseling and with the LSC and with um, Naomi? How are you all kind of working together in tandem to, to create such a robust system to support our students? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, there are many different ways that we find out about students um, who need support. It might be from the students themselves, from teachers, advisors, parenting adults, um, uh, coaches. And once that referral is made, um, it's actually shared with the entire team. So that includes all the folks, Davion, that you just mentioned. Um, and then uh, depending on what the issue is, um, a team will be formed to uh, help support that student and to coordinate among all those folks, like, okay, how are we gonna reach out to the student? How are we gonna provide the resources? We certainly don't wanna bombard them <laughs> with actually too much attention because mm, not all teenagers want all of that attention on them, but we strategize who's the best person to talk with, with the student. And then how can we coordinate care and support among those folks. So the way we do it is communication. It's through those mini teams that I talked about earlier. And um, it's through talking about and coordinating with what kind of support um, they are expressing uh, their need for or, or parents, parenting adults are, and then um, figuring out what is the best way to provide that support and who is the best person to, to provide it. Um, and then one last question, because I think it's also a really good one. Um, how, if, if, uh, if there's a conflict between students, do the advisors and advisory groups play a role in making repairs and, and helping restore those relationships? How, like, what's the advisor's role and what's your role as deans in, in facilitating that? Mm, that's a great question. Kendra, mm -hmm. do you want to go ahead? I, I've talked a lot. Um, well, I can I can uh, definitely start talking 
um, and share some of my knowledge, but uh, I, I invite you to step in any anything that I miss. So um, actually we are in, in our journey right now with restorative practices um, and being intentional. Um, and I think for years, uh, the, there has been a lot of work already around what it means to repair harm and what it means to uh, include and invite people back into community. Um, but that has become uh, more intentional uh, over, over last year and this year, especially uh, to really name restorative practices and the language of restorative practices um, within the community. Uh, so to speak to the question, if there is harm um, among students, uh, a lot of that is about sitting in, in a curious space of investigation. Um, and that may mean bringing in an advisor, that may be bringing in you know, teachers, it depends on, on where that, that site of, of harm or that site of conflict may have been. Um, but definitely as uh, class deans, we end up holding that conversation um, and trying to understand all of the different sides of the stories so that we can find ways that will both repair harm and invite everybody back into community. Um, so that's kind of a broad, a broad space for that. And it really is constituent dependent, um, but we do rely quite a bit on our advisors because they have such a deep relationship and they are an advocate for um, their individual advisees. And so they really get to know them in a deep level. And so whenever there is a conversation or there is a question, we can definitely go to that advisor and say, can you tell us more um, about who this individual is and how, and how they, their needs need to be met or can be met? Um, and help us to, to build those relationships and those bridges. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add, Chris? No, that was fabulous. Thank you so much, Kendra. Yeah, thank you. Awesome, thanks to you both so, so much for, for coming on and sharing a little bit about the, um, the advisory program and, and the experience of what it means to be in advisory in community at, at LIC. And so uh, moving on here, we are going to, um, to speak with uh, Winifred Montgomery, who um, works in our Learning Strategy Center. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Winifred, I hope that you had a great holiday. Good cusp, I did indeed, and I'm really ready for the rest of the semester. So good afternoon, evening, folks. Um, my name, as Davion has said, is Winifred, and I'm the director of the Learning Strategy Center. Um, there is another learning specialist, his name is Owen Dempsey, who works with me, but he could not be here with us tonight. So he's relying on me to share the important information with you. Um, and with that said, I am going to share my screen. Did that work? Okay, so um, the Learning Strategy Center is really well named. Um, we call it the LSC for short. And it has, um, the purpose is to really our primary mandate is to serve students who have been diagnosed with conditions which impact their ability to learn efficiently. Um, and our goal as part of that mandate is to really help them learn how to use their strengths to overcome their weaknesses. Um, because it be can become very easy to focus on the things you don't do well. And what we know in our guts is that your strengths are how you're gonna solve problems all your life. Your weaknesses are speed bumps that we're gonna get you over one way or the other. So celebrating your strengths is an essential part of the work that we do with our students. Okay, okay. so we also work with what we call the neurotypical kids. Those are students who don't have a defined learning difference necessarily. Um, so students, uh, between Owen and myself, um, we work with almost somewhere between a quarter and a half of the entire student body on one level or another. So a lot of neurotypical students come to us to say, wait a second, I'm not getting the grades that I want on my tests. How can I study more efficiently? Or I'm spending too long on my homework. How can I refine that process? Um, and so our, we really work with individual students to say, what are you doing? What's working well? What's not working well? What could we tweak? What are some ideas we could give you that would help you achieve the goals that you set for yourselves? We also, through our office, sponsor a number of programs designed to help anybody in the school be more successful academically. The peer tutoring, which is actually run by students, but it operates under the uh, auspices of our department. And uh, we also promote something called the Power Hour, which is a dedicated space where students can come in and work 
in silence, but in collaboration with other, you know, alongside other people, because some people really work best if they have other people around them. Uh, we present different workshops, either through the BMA program or through advising or throughout the year for students on different topics like um, how to get enough sleep and organizational strategies and whatever it seems like is called for in the community. And we have other programs that we offer to help people achieve their best selves. So we do not diagnose students in the LSC, but we can definitely work with students and their families to identify the factors that are holding students back and figure out what are the appropriate steps for them moving forward. Um, and if a student comes to us with a diagnostic document, we will help them essentially translate that into English so they understand their cognitive profile and can be uh, more efficient in how they use that to their advantage. There's a great deal of information on the uh, learning strategies pages of the Lick Wilmerding website. It's under the curriculum tab. And if I was able to operate my screen sharing properly, I would show you that link. But if you go to the, to the website and look for the curriculum button and pull down, it says learning strategies. And we have a number of different pages on there with resources related to testing, with um, information about um, technology that's available for students, and also with some really wonderful videos that are produced by our student interns, of whom we're very proud, uh, talking about their experiences being neurodiverse learners at Lick Wilmerding. So that said, what questions do you have for me? Um, so one question um, that is in here for, um, from Kim is, how do you reach out to and engage students who may be reluctant to ask for our support? That's an excellent question, thank you. Um, we do not pull students into the LSC because in order to build an alliance with a student, we have to be perceived as an ally rather than an enemy. And so we really do what we can to avoid becoming authority figures. But since we participate in the Triple S team, we are aware of students whose teachers and advisor have given us information about them struggling. And um, we will ask them to be referred to us or brought to us by a colleague. Like for instance, sometimes if they're working with the counseling department, a counselor will walk, walk them over and introduce them to us so that we can say, hey, we are here to help you become the person that you really wanna be. Thank you, Damian. Um, so we keep our ear very much to the ground in Triple S to see who thinks that they might benefit from working with us. And in fact, um, the teachers are very well aware of the efficacy of working with learning strategies. So they will often say to a student, hey, you should probably go talk to Ms. Montgomery. Or they'll say to us, hey, there's a student that I'd really like to have you work with. And so we will try to figure out what, is, what it is that they truly need so that we can support them as they truly need to be supported. Awesome. Uh, another question that I have, and I'm, I'm actually kind of blending a couple here, but um, can you talk a little bit about um, how a student's learning plan is developed, especially over time? Um, I know that Winifred, in one of our initial meetings, you gave me like a two minute rundown of what it was like from- I don't think it was two minutes. <laughs> it felt like that, but- if you could just give folks like, what does that look like from year to year? I think that'd be really helpful. Absolutely. We have a really carefully scaffolded program, which is frankly the envy of many another school. Um, generally, I like to, if you have a neurodiverse learner, I like to meet with families about now. So consider reaching out if you have a, a vulnerable learner and you'd wanna find out more. Um, and so I'll meet with the family and talk about what the reality of studying at Lick is like. Um, and I'm very, very forthright in that process because I know that for a neurotypical student, they can survive at any school. But if you have a vulnerable learner, it really matters where you send them for this leg of their educational process. Um, if that student then comes to Lick Wilmerding, um, I will get the documentation of their learning difference from the family. And from that, I will create a draft of a document that we call instructional adaptations. 
I will meet with the family over the summer to vet that document and to add important stuff that really doesn't show up in testing. They don't cover everything in testing by any stretch of the imagination. And then in the days immediately preceding the start of the school year, the family will come back and I will present this information to all their teachers with the family so that we're all in the room together and everybody understands who's on the team. And also so that teachers have a heads up for who might need a little extra attention from the beginning. The student will work with us over the course of the year on whatever is important to them. And that's also very individually determined. As a sophomore, the student will come in and work with Owen or myself for probably several hours. And we will help them develop an outline of the information that's contained in that document, which by the way, I forgot to mention, lives in our school system so that teachers can access it in real time from their grade rosters. So it's confidential, but teachers can, can find out what they need to know. Um, so, and then the student, the parents will not be invited to that sophomore meeting. The student will actually run it. Of course, we'll be sitting right beside them to keep them from freaking out too much. But it's a very friendly meeting because the teachers understand well how scary it is to talk to a room full of adults. And we've never lost anyone all these years. As a junior, they will come back and work with us for even more hours and we will help them start over again, but this time articulate in a document that we call the personal learning profile, what their strengths are, how they learn, what kind of accommodations they need. And we also do some goal setting with that process. Senior year, they don't have time for that. So they just come back and update everything and distribute it to their teachers. But um, senior year is where we get payback for all the torture that we've inflicted on these students by making them talk about wonderful characteristics and strengths, because a lot of that information is going to show up in the college admissions process. And other students are going to be like, oh my God, I have no idea what my strengths are. And our students are like, I got this. And I can say that so easily because I just was explaining this to a family this morning. Um, so the goal is for students to be really metacognitively aware, to understand how they learn and how to use their strengths to overcome any future obstacles. And they go on to be very, very successful in college. Hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> no, that was great. That was awesome. Um, Let's see here. Sorry about that. So what are some perhaps like accommodations or, um, you know, different, what are some different tools that our teachers and um, are equipped with that, that really, that, that may help um, kind sure. of students in, in the long run? What are some examples of, of things that we do really well? Um, lots of things. Um, I would say that um, we offer the usual accommodations, 50% extended time on assessments, 100% extended time on assessments, um, the use of a laptop to compose essays. I mean, whatever is um, appropriate in the documentation that is justified in the documentation that, that we can offer. There's some limitations. We can't really do for instance, triple time, because there's just not enough time in the day for kids to take a test and then attend classes. Um, so, but over the course, I, this is my, I think, 12th year at Lick Wilmerding. And over the course of those 12 years, I've put a lot of energy into educating teachers about neurodiversity. So they have become real advocates for understanding how you learn because they have seen what happens when a student who was really struggling suddenly says oh it's executive function i know what i have to do in this situation and i think that that understanding and that um embracing of neurodiversity as um, really i think of neurodiversity as one of the axes of diversity in our community um, and that we value because neurodiversity brings so many wonderful wonderful characteristics and outside the box thinking and uh, entrepreneurial behaviors. So teachers really value that. And, and they have learned that um, not to call something, for instance, a careless error if somebody makes what we call a transcription error. So we are really embedding an understanding that if we work with a student's brain as it presents, we can help them uh, achieve as much as they're possible as is possible for them. So I think that one of the things we do best is understand neurodiversity and respect it. There's a, a lot of our um, work is collaborative as well, which works really well for a lot of brains. Amazing, thanks so much. Um, I know that there's a ton of questions about this and, I, um, and we greatly appreciate them. And so 
Um, some of them can be answered on the on the website, and that's in the in the chat there. And I know that um, granted, she has a time when it's also um, available to answer questions via email from prospective families as well. So, um, so please do if you have, especially if you have a really specific question, um, reach out to her. But also utilize some of the the resources that we have online there. Thanks. Pop for my email into the website. Have a great evening, everybody. Thanks, you too. Appreciate you. All righty. So um, pretty much right on time, there's a question around um, mental health and how do we support students in that vein. And so next, we um, we have Erica and Yuka, um, our school counselors, to come speak to you about, about that programming. So uh, Erica, Yuka, feel free to, to take it away. OK, let me share my screen and we can start. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Yuka Hachiyuma. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I can provide support in both English and Japanese. So Nihongo demo supporto dekimasu. And hello, everyone. I don't see myself currently, but I hope that you can see me. Uh, my name is Erica Solis. I use she, her pronouns, and I can offer services in English and Spanish. Apoyo para las familias hispanohablantes. So um, the counseling department provides support to students, parenting adults, and faculty, staff, and administration. But it looks a little different for each group. So we're going to describe each of those constituencies in some detail now, starting with students. So um, we do provide a pretty full range of supports, um, but we'll never diagnose or treat a student for a specific mental health disorder. Um, we are both trained and licensed as therapists, but we don't provide therapy on campus. Um, but in terms of the supports that we do offer, um, we offer individual support with various aspects of student life, um, peer conflict resolution, help accessing outside services, crisis intervention and stabilization, and et cetera. Um, students often tell us that they aren't sure if their problems are big enough to talk to a counselor about, but we tell them that nothing is too small if you're wanting to talk it through with someone. All right, another way that we interact with students and provide services is by presenting on various topics that relate to adolescent life and to well being. Um, we often do that in grade level meetings, either presenting ourselves or bringing in outside organizations as guest speakers. And for example, some of the topics that we've covered thus far this year are boundaries and consent and substance abuse from a harm reduction approach. And also in working with students, we wanted to provide for you a few scenarios of um, some situations where we support students. Students often come in on their own or they are referred through triple S or through a parent or another adult in the community. Um, and so here are a few instances of what we might work on with students. Um, a student has been feeling low energy and low motivation recently, and they don't know what to do. Or a student is feeling overwhelmed by the workload and isn't getting enough sleep. Um, another thing that students might want to do with us is to explore different aspects of their identity. So they might be thinking about their race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, spirituality, or socioeconomic situation, and want someone to think with and talk about. Also, a student might have just gone through a painful breakup and they need some emotional support. Or a student might be concerned about their friend and want to know how to support them. Um, or a group of students might come by asking to talk about a difficult dynamic in their friend group and what to do about it. All right, so in terms of the supports that we provide for parents and guardians or parenting adults, we are here to support you as you support your teen. So you can get in touch with us to talk through concerns that you have for your child and how to support them. And we will also, sorry, I was jumping ahead to the, to the next bullet point. Um, yes, that's my bullet point one. So thank you, Ka. Okay. Um, yeah, so we also offer um, parent and guardian evenings on topics related to adolescent development. 
So um, in the past, we've offered presentations on transition to summer during the pandemic, um, as well as the depression, anxiety, and avoidance cycle. And this year, we're having a parent of alums speak to the parents and guardians about substance use from a harm reduction approach. Another service that we offer is helping you to figure out if your child or family needs outside support, and we can help you find a provider that is a good fit for you. Uh, that includes affordable mental health services. And we also serve as the primary liaison with outside providers. So we'll have a form in place that will allow us to communicate confidential information, and we'll be able to collaborate with outside providers to provide a layer of support at school. So some example scenarios that might come up for parenting adults. Um, this is a big one that might be really salient for all of you, but um, we often get uh, contacted by parents who are concerned that their ninth grader is having difficulty transitioning to high school, um, or they might be concerned about changes that they're noticing in their child's mood. Yes, over the years, I've often talked to parents who are concerned about their child's seeming lack of social connections at school. And other times parents will reach out to let us know that there's something going on in family life that could impact the student at school. So for example, a loss in the family would be a case where a family might reach out. So um, we also work very closely with um, faculty, staff, and administration here at the school. Um, and as part of the support team for each student, um, we work closely with families, administrators, teachers, and advisors in order to keep a focus on the psychological well-being of the student. Something else that we do is that we support teachers in their classes by doing in-class presentations on topics related to mental health and well-being. So for instance, this year, we went into each of the body-mind education classes in ninth grade to speak about the anxiety, avoidance, and depression cycle. And we will be returning to those classes in January to speak about eating disorders. We also provide professional development trainings to the faculty and staff. Uh, for example, we've presented on looking out and reaching out to students of concern. And once again, the depression anxiety avoidance cycle. Now you've heard this topic many times and that's because what we try to do is we try to present the same material to each group um, obviously tailored to each audience so that everyone is kind of all on the same page and they've heard the same information. And so there can be a lot of communication between school and home as well. And something else that we do big picture is that we collaborate with administrators to address any issues that come up in the school community. And we proactively act, um, advocate for systems that will increase and support student well-being. So let us give you a few scenarios of how we might interact with uh, faculty, staff, or administration. So for instance, a teacher is concerned about a student in their class who seems really down and often tired. So they may come and consult with us. There might be an advisor who's concerned that their advisee is juggling too much in terms of academics and extracurricular activities and sees the impact on them. Or a teacher might be preparing curriculum and they ask for input from us on how to address sensitive topics. Or a coach might be concerned about the health of a student athlete, and so they may come to us for a consultation. And now we would like to open it up for any questions that you might have for us. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, one question that kind of sticks out to me is just um, to what extent would you say the student body is open and willing to come to you to um, when um, when they are in crisis or when they feel they need um, need your support? Well, I, I think that we build in many layers that allow them to come to that point. So we start by meeting ninth graders to, we'll, we'll meet them at orientation and then we'll also come to their class to give a presentation and let them know who we are and what we're here for. And you know, we, we have contact points with students in each grade. So we're, we're building our contact with them informally in those ways. And we also have excellent connections with the other members of student support services like the deans and the learning services um, folks 
who, as Winifred mentioned, they can walk people over to us students and introduce them. And so it's kind of building on a connection that's already there. We often have students walk in the door um, and they have positive experiences. Recently, I had a student bring a friend, right? So it might be that a friend encourages someone to come in. And um, we also tried to build in the importance of that seeking help, seeking help is a strength and it's a skill that we'd like students to build who participate in the encouragement of those help-seeking behaviors. And so that, that gets students in the door and open to meeting with us when they're struggling. So at, as a team, I think we get students to come. Great. Um, let's see here. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, confidentiality and when um, it becomes appropriate to to um, to loop in or, or bring parents into into the conversations that you're having with students? Yeah, um, that's a really good question, and it's something that um, I certainly have many conversations with students about because just by the nature of us being part of the school, oftentimes students are concerned. You know, um, if I tell you something, who do you need to tell? And so I always frame it in terms of safety. And so really that um, primarily most things can be kept you know, confidential between me and the student, um, unless there's a safety concern, in which case it's really important for me to get other, uh, other adults involved. That might be the parents, it may be other people as well, um, really to ensure the safety of the student. And um, if it doesn't rise to that level, um, and say I'm having conversations with a student and I feel like though they've told me that you know that parents don't know um, and they really don't want parent to know like I will bring it up being like you know it seems like it might be really helpful if you were to be able to talk about this with your parent or it might be another adult like you know uh, I don't want my teacher to know um, but um, I think it's something that I certainly hold in mind as I'm having conversations with students that if it is beneficial for them, I will always float that idea to them and that it'll always be a conversation and a discussion. I won't go behind their backs and tell, you know, parents or teachers things about them because it's really important, like Erica was saying earlier about um, so much of our job is about building trust and relationships with our students. And so um, it's very important for us to, you know, have the student be part of that conversation of why I think, and, and hopefully why they also agree, that it's really important for other adults to be invo involved in supporting them. And so um, confidentiality is a question that often comes up and you know, particularly in terms of when to loop parents in, um, that is how I often explain it to the students as well as parents who ask. Um, you know, If they want to know something from me, then um, I think it's um, often talking about um, you know, what might make it hard for them to have that conversation directly with their student um, and um, trying to find a way where the student is the one that ultimately is the one that's sharing the information or certainly has agreed that, yes, this is something I want other people to know. So Erica, am I missing anything along those lines? No, I think that's that's all. I mean, I, I mentioned up front that when we collaborate with outside providers, you know, we, we follow the guidelines for mm -hmm. communicating, you know, legally what's confidential. And I think you covered everything else that it's a conversation with the student. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for your for your time this evening. I hope for folks in um, in the audience that this was helpful um, to you and, and hearing about one, the different scenarios um, that may come up um, in a high school student's experience, but also just learning about the robust um, help that, that Erica and Yuka are able to provide um, to our, our students on an everyday basis. So thank you both for the work that you do and for being here this evening with us. Thank you, Davion, and thanks everyone who attended. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so um, we are moving on here. And uh, next we have one of my favorite people on campus to come <laughs> and speak to you all. Uh, Naomi Piero Pena is here to, um, our Director of Student Inclusion um, is here to share a little bit with you all. Hey, Naomi, how are you? 
Hi, Davion. You really flatter me. You're also one of my favorite people. So I'm so happy to be here with you. Um, and I'm so happy to be here with the rest of these 205 participants today. Um, thank you. How are you doing, Davion? I am fantastic. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I believe it's time for me to share my screen. Here we go. I'm going to get into present mode. Excellent. And can you see that? Can I just? Excellent. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Naomi Fierro Peña. I use she, her, ella pronouns. Um, and I am the director of student inclusion. And thank you so much for hanging tough with me to the penultimate part of this presentation at almost five o'clock. So I'm going to do my best to keep this exciting um, and also brief. So what what is student inclusion mean? Um, I think about it in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and I often note that true inclusion cannot exist without equity. And so I do just want to make that really clear. Uh, I think about my work in three kind of different buckets. The first being my work uh, with the Center for Civic Engagement. They really are not only physically in the center of the school, um, but they are the center for, for student leadership and student activities and student life. And I feel really lucky and honored to work there. My job primarily is to train our students um, on how to activate their leadership. I believe, I do strongly believe that every person has the capacity and potential to be a leader. And I do this through a number of different things. First being, um, I invite and recruit young people from ninth grade through 12th grade to attend various leadership conferences. Um, so previously when we were able to physically uh, fly and attend different conferences throughout the country, uh, we would send young people to SDLC, which is the Students Diversity and Leadership Conference. Uh, it's actually happening now virtually. Um, then in January, we'll send young people to the Creating Change Conference. We won't be able to do that one this year, um, but typically that is a space for the entire nation to come together. Um, queer identifying folks get to be in a space where the majority of people are also queer identifying. And, and that is a really beautiful space that I'm really lucky to help young people um, experience and to really claim a part of their identity uh, in a proud way. Uh, and then we also send young people to the White Privilege Conference that happens in April of every year. And at the end of this, of each school year, we take the students that we've sent um, and we ask them to lead our own in-house conference called Samahara Days of Justice. It's typically a two-day conference um, where our young people partner with the adults on campus to create workshops uh, and, and to teach each other. It's a beautiful, like, co-learning space where uh, oftentimes I've seen our adults learn so much from our young people about equity, justice, inclusion, um, and what matters to them in the world today. And so that's, that's a really special time. I also get to do specific leadership training for our students of color. Um, I work hand in hand with the student inclusion chairs who our, I like to call them my mini-me's, they're often much better than me. Um, they work on the student council and their job is, is to be peer leaders in saying, you know, these are the areas of the school, this is what's happening kind of on the ground, so to speak, where we really need to create some programs, some community days, um, to bring our folks together because we're seeing a, a lack of inclusion or, you know, these folks really need to come together to, to talk across difference. And so how do we as young people uh, come together to, to help change that? And so that's my work with the student inclusion chairs. 
Um, and finally, uh, this ethnic studies initiative that I'm really proud of, um, it, it was a student led initiative, currently still is student led, where um, young people came together in January of 2019 and said, you know what, we, we want to change. We're seeing, we're seeing some inequities and we want, we want to change. And one of those changes, we want to see ourselves represented in our curriculum. And so um, they, there is a working group of 12 people, eight students and uh, four adults who are working to bring ethnic studies to Lake Wilmerding. Um, we know that is, it's now a requirement uh, for the state of California. So we're really excited to, to kind of be ahead of that uh, curve. So lastly, the last two things I, I get to do, one, again, my work with Student Support Services, who's the team that you've seen today. I get to coordinate each grade level retreat. Um, so that is a full arc of a program from grade nine to grade 12. Uh, each grade level has the opportunity to retreat together, um, to spend time away from campus and to really delve into, you know, who am I? Who am I in community? Who are the folks around me? Um, and how do we, enjoy each other outside of just, you know, what can be the competitive nature of the United States, right? Trying to trying to prove something about yourself. And, and our retreats are a space where you don't have to prove anything about yourself. Um, I've also, I mean, we've mentioned restorative practices, which is really exciting. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with restorative practices, but it's a beautiful both and of creating community where we're not only intentionally building trust and relationships, um, we are also repairing harm when harm is caused in communities. And so the repair, I think, is a really purposeful time where we bring folks together, whether it's student to student, um, adult to student, um, or two adults, right? Bringing them together to say, hey, look, this was the, the harm that was caused. What do we need to make things right? Uh, because we do believe in the power of community and, and knowing that we can solve our dilemmas and challenges together um, and we can repair trust in, 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 in any situation. Um, I am seeing that the time is almost up, so I will take us down to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, this is my really exciting work with our Dean of Adult Equity and Inclusion. I get to work with the Board of Trustees um, and in our Parent Association on making sure that we're all on the same page, coordinating to make sure our students are seen and heard. Um, and so I look forward to answering any of your questions. And um, if I don't get to those, we do have an equity and accountability webpage, um, which I can drop in the chat at a later moment. But thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Naomi. Um, one question that, that we have here is, um, to what extent would you say your work kind of oscillates between um, empowering students to be like very action oriented and just creating space for themselves to, to better understand each other and to understand themselves and they're and doing their identity work. I mean, you've been coming through with the hard hitting questions, Damian, and I want to commend you and compliment you for these questions. These are from the audience. It's not from okay, me. Hey, audience. <laughs> <laughs> I commend you and compliment you. Um, so how much of my time, right, is spent on, on both of those things? Um, I think that's a great question. And, and to really quantify, I don't know that that I um, can quantify it off the bat. But I do think, you know, a lot of the identity development work, right, happens, I think, for those young people that attend our, our leadership conference. They get to really say, this is a part of my identity, whether it be race-based, whether it be um, sexual orientation, or, or just at this stage in my life, at this 
15, 16, 17 year old stage in my life, um, retreats as well. That's a time that's dedicated specifically to just doing that deep identity development work of saying, okay, who am I? And how do I intentionally lean into these parts of myself? And what do I really need to look at and, and work on? So I think those are specific examples of that. Um, and I think this other part of creating action, that's, I don't think that you can have one without the other. You have to know yourself, I think, um, to really be able to lean into action with some integrity. And I think because I work that way, I know that I work that way with my young people. And so I take our young folks, um, specifically our student leaders, who say, you know what, Miss Pena, I'm ready. I'm ready. I want to do something. Um, and I say, let's make it happen. And, and it's oftentimes just uncovering and holding up a mirror to the strengths that they already have and saying, I believe in those, let's do these. Um, and that's how ethnic studies came to be. That's how restorative practices came to be. Um, that's how now we have a dedicated space just for our student leaders of color to be in community uh, and create together. That's, it's beautiful. And our students did that. And so, you know, I think those are, are part and parcel of the work. Perfect. Um, let's see. Can you, um, can you talk about your, your partnership with um, affinity groups, especially as we are thinking about um, building the ethnic studies program? Um, and like, where are we with that right now? <laughs> I love it. Again, great questions. Okay. Yeah. So my work with affinity leaders is, to be honest and to be frank in this intimate space with 200 of you, um, it's one of my favorite things to do uh, because our young people are so aware um, and just ready to really grasp onto to how proud they are of their identities. Um, and so I meet with our student leaders of color at least on a quarterly basis, if not more so. I think Davion, you walked into one of our first meetings where you heard our music bumping from down the hallway and we're like, hold on, this feels like family how can I be a part of it? And so our young people know that um, and they have spaces to at least once a quarter to come together, to create community celebrations, to create really powerful dialogues. For example, we're having um, cross-racial dialogues this week led by each of our um, student clubs like Latinos Unidos and uh, the Black Student Union and our Asia club, right? They're coming together to talk about things like mental health and sports and how that impacts people of color specifically. Um, and so like, those are some examples. Um, but to get to the question of ethnic studies, ethnic studies was brought about because the leaders of our student clubs said, this is what we need. As leaders of color, we're noticing these trends and this is how we want to fix it. This is, this is the solution we want. And so um, a lot of them are a part of the ethnic studies working group. And um, where we are, we submitted our first proposal last year to the administration. They said, you know what, this is a great first proposal. Here's some feedback. Here's what we need you to work on. And this year we're polling, um, you know, what are the places that already have seedlings right, of an ethnic studies curriculum, and how do we help those grow and formalize that into um, a curriculum, a program uh, that's not just one-off, but four years throughout your entire journey, right, because you're growing and changing, um, and so I'm hopeful, I'm, I know that we already have an elective class for juniors and seniors now, I'm hopeful to be able to provide two classes next year. Um, so it's not just <laughs> available to juniors and seniors, um, but that there are at least two classes being taught both semesters next year. Um, 
And so that's, that's the exciting thing that's on the horizon for us. Beautiful. I, I love it. I love the, the seedlings metaphor. Uh, I'm going to use that the next time I talk to someone about this. <laughs> um, thank you for your time, Naomi. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, one comment from Victoria Guzman, they really love your shirt. And so bringing <laughs> uh, the, the fire here in a lot of different ways. I uh, appreciate you. Um, I can't wait to see you again in person um, in a couple of days. All right, so moving along here, we have our, our student panel. Um, so students, if you could do us all a favor and turn on your cameras um, so that we can uh, do, the, do the panel here. Um, let's see, if you all could share your, your name, um, what pronouns, uh, your preferred pronouns and what school, what middle school you are coming from, also your year in school. Um, and like maybe one or two things that you are involved in outside of the classroom, that would be great. Um, the first person that I see is Sarah. So Sarah, can you? Uh... Yeah, great. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I use she, her pronouns and I am a sophomore and I do stage management for the school productions as well as running the Studio Ghibli Club. Uh, Maddie. Hi, I'm Maddie. Uh, I'm a sophomore. I use they, she pronouns. And I went to the Hamlin School for middle school. Um, and some of the things I'm involved with, I'm a leader of GSA, the Gender Sexuality Awareness Club. Um, and I am a class representative on student council. Uh, and I'm also really involved in the theater program and the dance program at school. Well, why don't you kick it to the next person? Your choice. Cool, Will, go ahead. Thank you, Maddie. Hey everyone, my name is Will. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I am currently a junior at Lick. Um, for K through eight school, I attended Star of the Sea School, which is a parochial school in the Richmond district of San Francisco. And on campus, I am a Lick Women admissions intern. And I'm also one of the leaders of the Asia Club. And I'm the captain of the varsity badminton team. Shima, go ahead. Thanks, Will. Um, hi, I'm Shima. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a junior and I went to Millennium School, which is um, on Valencia in San Francisco. And some of the things I'm involved in is cross country and I co-founded Multiracial Alliance Club at school. Beautiful, thanks for that. Um, so tonight folks heard about the various ways um, we as a school try to support you, um, you know, through your transition, during your time at, at Lake, um, and to help you become more confident people when you leave. And so um, one of the things that impresses me most about um, the school is y'all are coming from all over the place. Uh, <laughs> you know, some of y'all went to schools that I have never heard of until uh, meeting you. And so can you just describe what your transition was like? And yeah, can a couple of you just describe what your transition was like? And when you encountered a challenge, how did the school help support you um, in, in, in getting, getting over that challenge? Yeah, I can start. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> go ahead. No, you can go. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I was, so my experience, so I was really, honestly, really nervous coming into Lick, um, mostly socially, because I was the only one who came from my K-8 school, and I had been with the same people my entire life, like the same K-8 people, like it was like a small group of like 20 people were super close, so I was like, the idea of like meeting a whole new grade of like 140 people was like so terrifying to me. I think the first thing that comes to mind that helped me adapt to the new environment, I guess, was advising. Uh, like in frost orientation, we got in introduced to like a group of, it's like one advisor, which is like a faculty at Lick and maybe around like 11 to 12 students. And essentially your advisor is just kind of like your person, like to go to if you need like anything, if you need any help or anything like that, like they're your person. And it also introduced me to around like 10, 11 other kids who I knew, like I felt like I could depend on them. And then another thing that I think really helped me was in the classrooms, like 
each one of the classes were super, super collaborative. And I felt like I got to meet like a lot of new people through that. So like, I was really scared that it, the classes were just going to be like me looking at the board and I was just not going to have anyone to talk to. But I met so many people through my classes. And honestly, some of the people that I met in my classes freshman year are still my closest friends today. Um, and I guess I can go next. Um, I think, well, going into frosh year, I was online um, and Maddie was as well. Um, it was kind of rough because like, well, I came as a singleton, uh, only kid from my middle school. Um, and I think that the first challenge I really encountered um, was my math class, because I think this is just natural that going from middle school to high school, the difficulty level will increase a little bit. Um, and I think that the thing that helped me the most is seeking help from teachers and learning that that's an acceptable and perfectly normal and like encouraged thing to do. Um, because I say this a lot, but at like it's people teaching people um, and you don't feel like you're left behind. Um, so I think the relationships that I built with my teachers uh, really helped in that mindset of confidence that we talked about a little bit earlier um, and feeling like you can advocate yourself for yourself, which is something that I still do now. Yeah, uh, to build off of what Sarah was saying, I come from a very similar middle school as her, um, K through eight, all girls, small classes. Um, so when it was time for me to go to high school, I was very ready um, to have a new surrounding. I loved my middle school experience, um, but I had seen th the same people every single day for almost my entire life. Um, so I, was so overjoyed to walk into Lick and see so many new incredible people and not people that were exactly like me um, or had learned to know so well. Um, I was so ready um, to encounter all these new incredible people and I feel like I really did. And also um, being a freshman during COVID was really interesting and especially um, because of my specific family situation, I didn't go back to in-person school and everybody else did. Um, so I was on campus for maybe three weeks uh, for freshman year, <laughs> uh, which is not very many, but the faculty did an absolutely incredible job of including the people who remained online into the community um, and making sure everything was uh, connected and that my relationships would stay sound with everyone. Um, and now that I'm back on campus with everyone, it doesn't feel as if I missed time with people um, because the faculty has done such an excellent job of incorporating those who weren't initially back on campus. Thank you, That's, that was amazing. Um, so one of our goals in supporting students is really empowering them to create the high school experience that they want. We want you to own your high school experience. And so Shima, one of the things that you talked about was creating your own club. Can you talk a little bit about that process and, and why you wanted to create the club that you did? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so like I said, I co-founded uh, Multiracial Alliance Club uh, with my friend and so basically it's just a an affinity club but allies are also welcome um, for mixed kids at Lick and we um, didn't have it before but like my friend and I um, shout out to Bruno we noticed that there's like a lot of mixed kids like um, I identify as um, half black half Japanese um, and so we were like wow there's a lot of mixed kids here but there isn't really like a space for us so we were like how about we make that space so um we spend a lot of time like figuring out how we wanted to create this space and um one of our biggest goals is to be really inclusive you know like it's a really big um i like umbrella identity um and it's also kind of it, it can be hard to find like connections like um for lu they have like dia de los muertos and you know like other clubs have certain things like that but um so far we are new but we've been pretty successful we've had like a few meetings and um we've had like a, a like a good amount of people come and it's been like a really nice and fun space and um everyone feels really safe um yeah awesome thanks a lot um what advice 
would you all give to the prospective students and, and families that are, that are on tonight? What advice would you give them um, about just thriving at, at LIC? Yeah, Madam Lisa. Uh, I'm happy to start. Um, I think the best advice I can give is to go into the high school experience and the first uh, moments of high school with a very open mindset uh, because you never know what you will encounter. And I think it is a very common experience at Lick specifically to go into high school, knowing your passions, knowing what you love, building off of those at the school because there are so many opportunities to do so, but also find new loves and new passions because they were willing to broaden their hobbies and their interests. Um, and I think from my experience and from the experiences of other people that I've heard, it has really rounded out these people as a whole um, to have that open mindset um, and not be so fixed on perhaps who you were in middle school or um, the relationships and different things that came from middle school. Uh, it's a new time and it is a perfect time to try new things and build on the things that you love. Oh yeah, and kind of building off of that, I think that the hardest thing about that high school application process was like the reductive way that you had to look at yourself. You had to write down on paper what you were good at, um, things that you like to do and are planning on doing in high school. But um, like they said, you don't have to stick to that and it doesn't last forever. Um, and uh, I think that there's just so much to explore at like I, had never done stage managing in my entire life and i know that i had a passion for the stage but it's driven me into this whole new place that i didn't think that i ever want to go to um so yeah on the same note kind of just um go with the flow and know that uh you are more than what you necessarily have to be writing about right now and that like it's a good place to discover that yeah um just adding on to that i feel like in sometimes like in I don't know in the culture that we live in there's somewhat of like a desire to kind of just like be good at like some things and just like do the things that you're good at like stay in your kind of like path and just like be do those things that you're good at and like not really expand and I think Lick really gives you so many different opportunities to like explore like a bunch of different things like freshman year you can take like a bunch of different performing arts like like kind of like in some way it forces you to try like visual arts like performing arts like technical arts and I think like I've had a really great experience like in those things I really honestly I came into like with honestly not the most open mind I was a little closed off and I was like I'm not going to enjoy like painting but then I ended up really liking it and I have really enjoyed it and I've like been able to like take more classes I have like in like I've been able to kind of like explore my like enjoyment for art like through throughout like which I really appreciate yeah, um, I just want to quickly add on, like for me specifically, I would say it was the shops classes. Um, I was so, as a freshman, I was terrified of the machines. Um, it was, it was really scary. And it was just like so crazy to me how like students could even like make all these like amazing things. And, um, and I, I love it. I take it every year. Currently, I'm in circuits and electronics, analog and digital. And right now we're working on, um, we're making a speaker right now. And I'm just like working on my circuit and it's really hard and it's really confusing. But my teacher, Mr. Sasson is like one of the most supportive teachers and my classmates. Um, we always have like so much fun um, and we get confused together and we work together. Um, and I just, it's really cool. Like I've made a lot of cool things that I've never thought I'd ever make before like picnic tables for like local schools and stuff. It's really cool. Amazing. Um, there's a question about uh, introversion and extroversion amongst the student body. How would you how would you describe because you all are extremely well spoken, you all are are, are great. And so um, how would you describe the student body in terms of introversion and extroversion at, at the school? I'm happy to start this off. Um, I am very much an introvert um, and I recognize that. I try to take pride in it as much as I can. And I think when looking at the student body, you see a very wide variety of different kinds of people when it comes to introversion and extroversion. Um, and I think there is a huge population of both. Um, and I found that it's really 
easy to find your people based on that. Um, and I think it's pretty common sometimes for the more extroverted students to hang out with other more extroverted students. Um, but I also don't think at the same time uh, that that is a limitation for meeting new people. Um, as a very introverted person myself, I have met so many incredible people that I didn't feel at first that I would have the courage to go and talk to or learn more about in the first place. Um, and when I'm at school, I don't feel so much pressure um, because I'm so introverted because I'm around the people I love and I've learned to love them from being at Lick. Um, and that whole, the, all that anxiety around being an introvert just totally goes away. Um, which is not something I had experienced before I got to Lick, um, which has been very relieving. Will, you can go, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Sarah. Um, I guess I can talk about my personal experience as well. Um, when I came into Lick as a freshman, I had, I identified myself as an introvert and I felt like, I don't know, I was just really, honestly, just scared of people. I think I already talked about this, but I think like Maddie said, it really like, when I met so many people at Lake that were just so welcoming and like, I found people who I just really vibed with. I really like felt like I could be myself around them without any like judgment. I felt like I could just like relax when I was around them. And it made me feel so comfortable that I feel like, I don't know, I felt just more relaxed around people. And I think I became an extra. And now I would definitely consider myself an extra. Like, I love being around people at Lake. I'll look forward to coming to school every day because like the people are great and I love just seeing everyone. So yeah, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> oh no, it's all right. Um, I think that the way I would describe myself, I would say I'm a loud introvert. Um, I think that it's not necessarily about like, what's your MBTI personality type? There's a general creative aura and obviously you don't need to be good at art. It's just kind of like the in inquisitiveness and way that the students carry themselves, regardless of whether you would feel comfortable with being the only person you knew in a room or not. Um, there's a general air of open-mindedness and um, willingness to make connections um, that I think everyone shares. And so, um, of course, being online, that was really hard for me. Um, but of course, some people really enjoyed it. Um, and speaking to them in person, um, you know, there are people that you would never think that you would get along with at first because, oh, you're an introvert, I'm an extrovert. Um, but one of my friends and I had a conversation recently and they're like, oh, you seem like such an extrovert. I was intimidated by you. And I, no, that's not the case at all. Um, so I think that it's not necessarily about the binary of, oh, are you introverted or extroverted, but are you willing? And I think that the Lick students are. And I think that that effort is something that comes through and something that I really value. All right, uh, last question to, to kind of close us here. Um, how would you um, describe the the lick experience in so far for some of you, uh, for most of you so far in no more than three words. <laughs> One of your words can be hyphenated. Um, the hyphen really adds some character. Lick Wilmerding. Anyways, um, I think my three words, they make a sentence. I'm still learning. Um, that just speaks for itself. This is not an easy question, but I will try with my three. Um, loving. Curiosity, that doesn't really fit with the sentence, but curious people um, and driven driven in nature, hyphenated. <laughs> okay, I can take this one. This, this took a second. Okay. Um, and it's not like a sentence. So we have eye opening. Um, incredible. 
and um, grateful. Yeah, I'm trying not to overthink this. Um, fun, um, tight knit, and humbling. Awesome, I love it. Um, speaking of, of grateful, I'm grateful for, for you four to, um, for sharing your experiences um, with us all tonight, really appreciate it. Um, and grateful for everyone who, who's on tonight. So thank you for, for being here with us to, for, um, for listening to all of our, our panelists today and all of our, um, our student support services team. Um, and talking about how we try to support our students, how we try to support our community. I'm um, looking forward to getting to know your child through the process. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or the admissions team via phone or email, how, whatever best works for you. Um, we are more than happy to help. So um, enjoy the rest of your night. I hope that you have a great dinner. Um, for the folks who are not home yet, students um, get home safely. Um, and I hope to see you tomorrow. See you later.